All right, let's see. So the plan for today, like I mentioned, um, we're gonna review a few things that we've been doing in this class that are gonna be relevant to today's uh, guest lecture. And then Dr. Emer Emily Nian is gonna be uh, joining us and they're gonna be doing a lecture on academic creative nonfiction and um, academic publishing. Um, and like I, like I said, uh, and I say it at the bottom here on these little notes, cause I don't ever do the normal PowerPoint. I always like to have it, you know, you see what I see. Um, so today is going to be, and that, and that's going to be about getting, uh, better, at understanding and approaching academic writing. And, um, also expressing yourselves in academic context. So um, thinking about like, we might think about it like consuming and producing um, academic writing. So one thing that I did wanna, oh, right, sorry. And then at the end, um, or rather, so once uh, Dr. Nian is gonna be, is done with their lecture, um, we're gonna do a little Q and A. So you can ask some, ask some questions. And something to bear in mind about the guest lecture today, I, um, I will be, I'll be posting the PowerPoints, the lecture will be recorded, you'll have it um, to review. The things that, um, that Dr. Nian's gonna be talking about um, aren't going to just be relevant to this class. My hope is, is that um, it will also, the things that they talk about are also going to really help you in, um, in other classes as well, just sort of wrapping your brain around, um, you know, uh, really um, getting in the heads of um, getting in the heads of uh, of of the um, of the people writing and sort of getting a better understanding of what the people writing in academic papers are thinking about in terms of their audiences because it's this feature of communication where we're constantly thinking about okay what's in the other person's head what is it the thing that they're trying to what are they trying to tell me um, and as I imagine probably a lot of you experience even just with the article um, by Robin Zhang that you read last week, uh, sometimes you can feel a little bit in the dark, right? About, you know, like, what am I supposed to be paying attention to here? Why is this thing getting framed in this way? What is this terminology that's getting used? This sort of thing. Um, and there's some things that Dr. Nian's going to be talking about today that'll sort of like help you um, approach that kind of writing or rather give you some um, give you some tools give you some things to think about maybe like a starting point for um, getting in there and trying to grasp a firmer understanding and answering those kinds of questions about like all right so what are they assuming about me what should I be paying attention to here uh, that sort of thing and then additionally um, on top of that talking about uh, producing your own kind of academic writing. Okay, so um, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna cover a few slides that um, probably are going to look a little familiar. These are um, the relevant bits that we're gonna be talking about. Um, before getting into getting into our guest lecture, um, are from um, are from are from past things that we've talked about. All right, so uh, this was one that we did way back when when we were first starting out in the class. You know, asking this question of what does this word ethics mean? And um, as many of you talked about on your midterm exam. Um, and the, and the module two worksheet. Uh, in this class, we define ethics as investigating, being conscientiously attentive to, and or trying to be, meet the basic needs and sustain legitimate expectations of others as well as our own uh, basic needs and expectations, right? 
Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that we've investigated going about doing ethics in this class, right? So we've, uh, we looked at those different kinds of ethical theories. And as some of you may have noticed, some ethical theories provided us with, um, with perhaps clearer answers, or, or rather some, some ethical theories were better suited for, um, for maybe uh, giving direction in terms of, you know, thinking about the mindset of other people. So like when we were talking about, um, when we were talking about the importance of respect, right? When we were talking about Kant, um, that's a way to be conscientiously attentive to uh, a sort of uh, a sort of basic need of other of other human beings. Um, additionally, when we're thinking about doing ethics, right, like doing the right thing, that was another way that we took care in in um, in in ethics. We were talking about utilitarianism and thinking about, you know, like does do the means or yeah, rather, yeah, do the, uh, are the, are the means worth it um, to provide for the ends, right? So like if we could save um, a bunch of people by, you know, maybe making a smaller group of people uh, slightly less comfortable or something like this, that sort of provided us with, um, with uh, a clear and direct formula for deciding the right thing to do, right? So, um, that was one sort of lens that we were looking at um, these different complicated ways that we can uh, investigate, try to be consciously attentive to, and do things that uh, provide for basic needs and sustain legitimate expectations of others as well as ourselves. Another more recently, um, sort of lens that we were seeing ethics through was that lens of oppression, right? So we were talking about all of these different, um, all of these different faces of oppression that we were, remember, uh, not last week, but the week before, um, seeing different um, aspects of oppression and sort of uh, how maybe a specific form of oppression um, might uh, might manifest, say, in terms of um, uh, exploitation, like we were talking about. Um, and uh, one thing that we sort of touched on at the very end, after talking about all those different faces of oppression, was the significance of this general principle. And this was something we very briefly, uh, very, very briefly talked about, some of you might remember, um, where one general takeaway from that entire discussion was that it's really important to adopt terminology that someone uses to talk about themselves when referring to that person or discussing or analyzing aspects of that person's experience, because um, that kind of recognition of the experience is an integral part of respecting someone. And, um, and one thing that we talked about is really important to do uh, in order to sort of uphold that principle is that we need to listen to what other people say, not just how they describe themselves, but also how they describe their own experiences. So um, like I was sort of mentioning in the very beginning of class just now about how, um, you know, there's this feature of communication where we're thinking about what other people are thinking about when they're trying to communicate to us, like, what is this person trying to make me understand that sort of thing? Um, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very, it's not just a matter of like hearing the words coming out of someone's mouth. It's about putting together, you know, like what their words are trying to convey to us that perhaps we can think of it as a very rich sense of the word listen. And it's that kind of listening that we want to use when we're thinking about different kinds of oppression, right? We're trying to understand experiences of oppression and various social issues that surround those forms of, um, of oppression. Uh, and <clears throat> You know, one of the, um, or rather, let me start again. 
So uh, that is roughly, or not, um, that was one of the important takeaways that we were, that we were, that we were thinking about when we were seeing again, when we were seeing um, ethics through this, this lens of oppression. So we have different ways just to sort of sum up um, what I've been saying here. We've been looking at different ways to approach a super broad range of contemporary um, moral issues. So, uh, so we were, we, um, we were looking at, you know, these different ethical theories. Some of those ethical theories felt slightly better suited to ans answer certain ethical questions. And then we were seeing um, also these contemporary moral issues through the lens of oppression. And, um, and one of the key things to answering those, um, those issues raised when we're looking at things through this lens of oppression uh, is to listen and really understand, um, you know, what people are saying, um, you know, uh, about their, their experiences of oppression um, in order to, and we have to employ that kind of listening. We have to do that kind of listening um, in order to really understand um, what, what, uh, yeah, really understand the issues that come up, um, or and and the um, and uh, some of the potential solutions to those issues that uh, come up when we when we talk about a specific form of oppression. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any questions? I know that. I'm doing I'm doing the thing right where I'm like talking about things in these big broad um, sort of abstract ways uh, and um, this is you know something that we've been doing a lot in this class is like going over these ideas again and again doing the zooming in and zooming out um, that we so often do in the class so um, if anyone has any questions sort of like, uh, you know, can you explain again, um, you know, this big idea surrounding like the seeing, seeing these contemporary moral issues through the, through the lens of the different ethical theories. Um, if you, if you'd like me to try explaining that one again, or if you'd like me to try explaining, you know, seeing those issues through the lens of oppression again, um, feel free to, uh, feel free to ask now. Um, okay. All right. And again, I just, I want to reiterate that this is really to just sort of give you some context about um, how you can apply some of the tools that you're going to be developing um, today or learning about today when it comes to um, consuming and producing um, academic writing. And if you have any questions you'd like, you could, you know, during the lecture or um, or after class, you're welcome to email me. Okay, so um, we uh, talked about all those different forms of oppression, and then last week we talked about some ways um, to sort of. Uh, taking I sort of taking a step further beyond all right so we understand like listening is really important when we want to talk about these these issues connected to oppression um, and then last week we looked at Robin Jang's uh, role ideal model for responsibility to um, help us identify some more concrete things that we can do in response to these issues that um, that we that we identified the week before. Um, and so, as a lot of you probably remember, um, the role ideal model for responsibility um, is the idea that for every social role R, so we're going to abbreviate a social role as the letter R, occupied by an individual, and that individual we're identifying as P, it's like a placeholder like you do in algebra, right? A role ideal is P, so like that person, that individual's interpretation of how uh, they should best satisfy the expectations constituting their role that they're occupying. So we're talking about different social roles. So you want to think about the expectations um, for, you know, somebody who is operating within that role in the most ideal, best kind of way. Um, and that 
notion, that understanding of the most ideal, best kind of way is based on that individual's own beliefs, their values, commitments, abilities, and lived experiences. So um, really pushing ourselves to maybe listen, pay really close attention to um, what people are saying, especially when it comes like we see a major social issue, something connected um, to, um, to a form of oppression, you know, really trying to open up our minds and listen to the people who are most affected by those forms of oppression to help sort of maybe modify some of our beliefs, values, commitments, abilities, and lived experiences in um, constructing what that ideal role looks like. So that's sort of a long and complicated way of saying your role, so what you can do about these issues, your uh, responsibility to address um, those, those issues in changing uh, systems of oppression, um, so the systems that support uh, a particular form of oppression or perpetuate it, is being the best kind of R you can be. So um, here we can start filling in that letter R with various kinds of values. We have student, citizen, sister, neighbor on here, the picture I have a lot, uh, soccer mom, consumer, cook, aunt, cousin, um, et cetera. So really, you know, just pushing ourselves to think about all these different roles that we occupy, you know, and like, what does the best kind of um, uh, coach look like, right? Like, um, and, that, and that sort of thing. So, um, what we want to turn our attention to, or rather, so one thing that is really important throughout all three of these different things that I'm talking about, these three little points that I'm reviewing from, um, from lectures and readings you've done in the past, is that uh, it's really important to do the best you can to understand the information in front of you. And um, this, it brings us back to uh, really one of the steps that we talked about concerning conceptual analysis in the very beginning of class. So, um, remember we talk about, you know, stepping back, looking for good resources, um, thinking about the conclusion and you know, the premises that support that conclusion in an argument, and then taking a beat and thinking about the um, implications of a, of a particular argument. So that second step, that one where we're really sitting and going, okay, so um, you know, like, what are the best resources here that I can use to understand a problem? Um, involves going to look for the experts. And like, you know, I talked about um, in, the, in the lecture on, um, on, uh, on oppression, you know, one of, you know, the, the most important uh, group of experts there are going to be the people that are the ones that experience that kind of oppression. Um, and, uh, and additionally, you know, when we're, looking at or examining certain factual claims, um, maybe about disparities in uh, access to healthcare um, or negative effects that, you know, really policing a school, right? Like a high school. I think that it was Shaney Lee that talked about um, her experience at that high school um, in Brooklyn, like going to that, um, going to that kind of, um, going to that kind of high school, going to that kind of environment. One way, like we're gonna wanna listen to the experience of, the, of those students. And um, we could also look at factual evidence concerning, um, or not rather not factual evidence, but more research, uh, possibly like a, some kind of like statistical analysis on the effects 
that, um, that kind of approach to like having, you know, the metal detectors and a bunch of cops on campus and this sort of thing, how that um, affects students. So looking at all that kind of data, right? So we're, we're looking at a big old range of stuff. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, testimony. We're looking at, you know, like how that affects students. We're looking at um, potentially like some, uh, some st statistical analysis, that sort of thing. Approaching that information more broadly is going to be, or rather trying to seek out, consume, understand all of that information more broadly is going to boil down to really, you know, making that effort to understand the information that's being presented to you. So um, this point is what brings me to Dr. Neam's uh, um, guest lecture for today, um, and uh, and I'm gonna have I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in just just a moment. Um, but it's thinking about you know this is so the so again I just want to reiterate um, in this guest this guest lecture is going to be all about giving you some more tools for better understanding the range of things that I just talked about, this, these, um, this review I did of several of the concepts we've been working on um, in, this, in this class, okay? Um, so before we dig in, does anyone have any questions? And if you're just like, I don't understand, you know, really how this is supposed to, you know, I, I don't get it. Can you try explaining something again? Um, you're, you're welcome to ask that question like in the chat box or whatever. Okay. All right. Well, um, just give me one moment. Uh, it's not going the way that it's showing. Um, here we go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Neam. You wanna? And I made you the co-host. Just yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Thea. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Dr. Emer Emily Neenan. Um, I'm uh, I'm from Ireland. I'm an Irish lecturer. I did my PhD at. Trinity College in Dublin, and I'm currently a lecturer at um, Southeast Technological University in Ireland. Um, can everyone just confirm that they can hear me? I don't mind if you say it out loud or chat. Great. Hello. Yes. Okay, yes. I'll try to keep an eye on the I'll try to keep an eye on the chat box um, while I'm talking, so that um, you know. So if you want to make comments or questions as we go along, um, that sounds good. Um, okay, so let's share. And you have to tell me if you can see this. <laughs> you able to see this? Yes. Great. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> All right. So I have kind of two sections to this talk, and the first section is in three parts. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about academic writing. Academic writing is one of my areas of like real interest. Um, and it's something that I think, uh, ties in really well with the stuff that Leah has been talking to you about, um, about taking control of our own, um, you know, place in the world and being a, being aware of the power, uh, dynamics and the, you know, the socio-political implications of, things that are sometimes presented to us as very straightforward and very just black and white and this is how it's done and this is just like the normal way of doing things but actually there's always a history to it and there's always power dynamics and there's always you know economic implications to what we do um so that's what I'm going to talk about and then uh 
because I wrote my own PhD thesis in uh, alternative creative format, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as like an example of um, a form of academic writing that's outside of the norm. <laughs> um, and at the end, we can have questions or I can go through, there's like a couple of other topics that you guys might be interested in. So um, we can we can see what we want to feel like at that point. <laughs> um, so to introduce my background, I'm uh, I'm originally a geologist. I studied geology um, for my undergrad. My master's is in geophysics, but while I was working on my geophysics master's, um, my master's was funded by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization that monitors the globe for nuclear activity. So I ended up doing some outreach and I attended their conference, which is partly science uh, and partly, um, you know, po politics, because obviously when you're trying to do that kind of work, it's not enough to be able to monitor the globe for nuclear activity just scientifically. You also have to make sure that every country is signing up to the protocols and sharing their data and, you know, and there's the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is still not in effect because a certain number of countries won't sign, including the US. So um, it was a really interesting experience for me. And I'd always been interested in the like political side of science. Um, but it was a really like it was a real impetus for me to leave that program. I was supposed to finish my PhD in geophysics, but I actually wrote it up as a master's and went back to start a PhD in um, science education and science communication. So my uh, PhD was in um, earth science and climate change education in Ireland. Um, and that was a really good experience for me. And I ended up getting really interested in like philosophy and the academic writing stuff and, and lots of other things. So now I'm like figuring my way out of like where I want to most spend my academic energy. <laughs> um, so at the moment I'm teaching at um, SETU, which is a brand new university. It's been formed from two technical colleges who have uh, merged to form a university. So it's a really interesting time to be there. Um, and I mostly teach uh, research methods, um, like educational philosophy, um, academic writing, academic um, inquiry, like, you know, how to engage with academic subjects. Um, and I still have a deep love for geology. So I work geology into some of those things sometimes, but it doesn't always fit. <laughs> okay, so please do use the chat box. Let me know if you're following not doing um you know what you think whatever thank you all right well so for the first part of this talk i'm going to talk about academic writing generally um i'm going to talk about the academic publishing uh industry and then i'm going to talk about creative nonfiction as it can fit into academic writing and please ask questions if you're not following because i'd much rather stop and answer a question than get to the end and somebody didn't actually understand what I'm saying. Um, so this slide comes from when I started teaching online, I decided to put memes in all of my uh, lectures just to amuse my students at the time who were kind of having a hard time. Um, but we have this idea of like, when scientists or when researchers or when academics are communicating, there tends to be like a huge amount of jargon. Um, and partly that's completely natural because when you are talking about something very complicated, it makes sense that you would have a shorthand and that you would have a, a way of describing very technical, very complicated things. So it is natural and normal and there's always going to be a certain amount of that. Um, but also there's uh, an element to it of almost showing off um, that you understand this dialect and that other people don't understand that dialect. And even if you can say it in a simpler way, you don't really feel like saying it in a simpler way because you want to use your special words that you've learned. And an element of gatekeeping where some people will deliberately use a level of jargon that they know that other people in their field and especially other people like them in their field will understand, but that 
normal people or outside people won't understand. Um, so the first part we're going to do is about academic writing. So we're going to learn about the purposes of academic writing. Um, and I'm also going to share some tips on how to improve your own academic writing. Can you tell me, um, like, have you done academic writing outside of essays? Um, I presume that you have written essays. I have been doing a research paper. So I've done a couple of research paper on health, um, health outcomes. Okay, great. Yeah. So that kind of thing. Um, just to get a sense of like where people are. Um, because I've taught this stuff to like people halfway through their doctorates who have obviously like already started being, yeah, exactly, publishing research papers and lit reviews and stuff. I've also taught it to like, you know, first year undergraduates or teenagers um, who have absolutely no idea where they're coming from. <laughs> so, um, okay, cool. Got a sense of it. So when we're doing any kind of communication, when we're doing any kind of speaking or writing, um, there are three things that I think really impact how we communicate, how we use our language. Um, the first thing is who you are yourself. So as an individual person in the world, um, when you are speaking or writing, other people will understand a little bit about you based on the language that you're using. So not even what you're saying, but how you're saying it, what word you use, um, what topics you talk about, but you know, the actual language itself. We do a lot of this unconsciously um, because it's just the way that we learn language. Obviously, we just mimic and echo and uh, synthesize the language that we hear around us. So if the person that you are is an Irish person, you will grow up hearing and speaking and understanding the dialect of English that is used in Ireland, which we sometimes call Hiberno-English. Um, Hiberno-English is noticeably distinct from other forms of English. If you gave me transcripts of different English dialects, I would be able to tell which one was the Hiberno-English one, um, because that's my native dialect. There are thousands of dialects of English, they are all equally valid. There isn't such a thing as proper English that's the real English and that all of the other dialects are based off of that English. Um, there is a obviously standard English that is used in the UK and a standard English that is used in the US and both of those standard Englishes think that they're the real English. <laughs> but they are just also dialects um, and when I am in the UK or the US, I know that I am able to understand their dialect completely a lot of the time, the, the like standard version, because obviously the UK and the US both export a huge amount of their, yeah, so we get a huge amount of, uh, you know, like, like I grew up watching UK television shows and US movies. So when a person in New York who's speaking I'm in New York right now. The person in New York is speaking to me in like the standard American English. They will assume that I will understand them and I will understand them because I've watched their movies. Whereas if I speak to them in the way that I would speak to, you know, my grandmother or like the friends I go drinking with, they wouldn't always understand what I'm saying. Um, but equally, there's lots of people in New York who would be speaking different dialects that I wouldn't understand because they haven't made movies so you know if I'm speaking to a lot of people who are like different races different ethnicities um who have their own dialects of English within standard American English um or slightly outside of standard American English or um different classes all of those people have like different dialects of English they are all valid dialects of English and when I am speaking academically it used to be that I would naturally and automatically pick that I wasn't supposed to speak in real Hiberno English. I was supposed to mimic the standard UK version of English and that that's how we speak in academia. So for example, I don't, I'm not supposed to say ye when I'm talking to a group of more than one person. I'm supposed to say you 
because in standard UK English, we have flattened the third person, no, second person uh, plural to just be, we use the, we use the same pronoun for both plural and singular second person. So we use you for both of them. English used to have thou, which was the, like the equivalent of the second person singular, but we stopped using it. Um, in Hiberno English, we use lots of different, depending on where you're from in Ireland, you use like ye or yiz or yizer or whatever. Um, and I, at some point decided that I actually, it really annoys me that we don't have a differentiation between I'm talking to one person and I'm talking to a group of people, but we could, and I actually do have it. <laughs> so why wouldn't I use it? Um, so I started using it and that's something that people can now tell about me when I'm talking to, uh, you know, groups. I'm, I'm not hiding that aspect of me. That's a part of my identity is that I'm Irish and that I, you know, I come from a certain place and I speak a certain dialect of English. Um, and I've made a deliberate choice to not hide that about myself. So when I'm speaking and I say, you know, how are you doing? People who understand Hibernian English or people who have heard of that pronoun in Hibernian English will now know that I'm Irish. Um, if you do do that kind of thing, uh, editors will give out to you. Um, and sometimes you are able to push back against them and sometimes you aren't. We'll talk about more about that later. So, who are you and what do you want to say about yourself when you're writing? The other way that we change the way we talk or that we have different ways of talking or that we have different ways of communicating is depending on who we're talking to. And that will, again, that's completely natural. Sometimes we have this idea of if you speak in some way when you're um, you know, talking to a certain type of person and then you change the way you speak to talk to a type of person, that you're being disingenuous or you're being, uh, you know, deceitful in some way, but it's uh, it's completely natural and it it makes sense. And you would never have to come up with a, a single way of talking that will apply to everyone because you are a different person when you're talking to different people, and that's fine. You have many facets as a as a human being, so you can be, you know. A worker and you can also be a sister and you can also be you know a guild leader for your board gaming group or whatever and you can speak differently depending on the role that you're doing like Leah was talking about you have different roles in your life and you want to figure out what kind of version of that role you can be that also applies to how you're speaking so when I'm speaking to this kind of group um even though I just said all of that stuff about how I speak Hiberno English, I am still, I'm trying to be clear and I'm trying to use the type of language that everyone will understand rather than using lots of Hiberno English slang or speaking really fast because I don't know how fast you think I'm speaking, but uh, Irish people tend to speak pretty fast. <laughs> um, and I've noticed that in conversations. Um, yes, says <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> Well, we can uh, still hear you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Let me know if I start going too fast because that is a problem that we have had in the past. <laughs> um, you also speak differently depending on um, your role, depending on the other person's role, the other person's relationship to you, how many of the other person there are. Um, those are all completely natural. And when we are communicating deliberately, for example, if you're writing a academic paper and you're deliberately communicating, there's often a standard way of doing it, or there'll be a way that either has been taught to you as the way to do it, or the way that just comes naturally when you start doing it based on your own pattern recognition skills. But I think it's really valuable for anything that you want to deliberately put out to the world to think about who is likely to read this and who you want to read it or who is likely to listen to it and who you want to listen to it. So to continue my example of the ye thing, when I write in an academic article, I know that that's going to make some people feel like I'm stupid. I'm not writing English correctly. I haven't even noticed that I'm writing in my silly little dialect instead of writing in proper English way. Um, 
there's also people who might be uncomfortable with it because they're they they don't think that you should do that kind of thing they they will think that I am doing it on purpose and that I'm being balshi or I'm being um wait is balshi we know <laughs> um you know that I'm that I'm being obstreperous that I'm being um uh that I'm, I'm putting something into the wrong place, basically. But there are also people who will be reading it who will speak like me or speak, you know, that, that grew up speaking hybrid of English or grew up speaking a different dialect of English, um, like African-American vernacular English or like, uh, you know, the different Englishes that you get in all around the world or like, you know, Yorkshire English or Cornwall English um, who are from the UK, but don't fit into the standard types of English. Um, and maybe if they see the ye, they'll think, oh, I can do that, or we can do that, or this person also speaks a dialect English that isn't the super fancy posh English. And the reverse is also true. We find it less easy to notice because when some things become default or the typical or the normal or the like generally accepted, we see it uh, it's harder for us to see it depending on if something's out of the ordinary so if a thousand research papers are published and all of them use you for third person plural second person plural i'll eventually get these right second person plural um it's hard for us to see that that's a deliberate choice because it's easy to see the one that doesn't do it but they are both a choice um, they might not be a choice that you've made consciously or that you've thought about, and they don't have to be a choice that you've thought a lot about. But if you do think about it, you're always going to have some people who feel slightly included and some people who feel slightly excluded based on your language choices, based on like how you are choosing to communicate it. And a lot of the time, it's always the same people who feel slightly excluded that tends to be the people who don't come from, you know, the posh academic backgrounds and the people who might have abilities. And I would prefer when I'm communicating, if there's a chance that I could make somebody who usually feels a little bit excluded, actually feel a little bit included this time. And if I could have the chance to make somebody who feels, who always feels included, maybe feel a little bit excluded this time i prefer to do that than the other way around um obviously it doesn't always work because sometimes the person who is publishing the thing is going to be one of the people who will feel excluded by what you've chosen to do and they will ask you to change but you know when you can <laughs> um so when i was writing my phd thesis this was something that i thought a huge amount about because i wanted to write it in a way that would feel inclusive to people like me and people like the people I was working with and the people I was working with included Irish teenagers so I chose to write it in a way that I felt somebody like me and or somebody like the students I was working with would feel more included which automatically meant that people who expect to read a very straightforward standard thesis written in proper academic language might feel excluded or might feel like, you know, judgmental of me. Um, and that's obviously a choice I made and it was an easy, it was easy for people to see that that was the choice I'd made, but it is also true the other way. If you choose to do it in the very straightforward traditional academic way, that is still also a choice. Um, and there's lots of reasons why you would make that choice. I don't think my choice is necessarily better or, or like more valid or more virtuous or anything. Um, but I would like people to recognize that it is a choice, that you are making a choice and your own reasons for what that choice ends up being. But unless you examine who you are communicating and who your audience is and who you want your audience to be then your choice is just going to be an unconscious choice instead of a choice that you deliberately make
The third thing, which I have separated out, even though it is intrinsically tied into the first two things, is that you have values for how you want to put yourself forward in the world and you have values for how you want to communicate. Um, for my pieces that I wrote in my strange way, I wanted to write it in that way because of who I was and because of who I wanted to read it. But also the methodology I was using for my PhD was a learner's rights methodology. Um, and I had a lot of time on like inclusivity and, uh, you know, giving a voice to my participants and that kind of thing. Um, and it felt like it didn't line up very well with the values of the research to go away and write it in, uh, in a traditional way because I didn't do the research itself in a traditional way. I didn't think I should do the writing in a traditional way because the writing is inherently part of the research. Um, and there are lots of ways in which your values might influence your way of communicating from like, I'm gonna completely restructure how I write my thesis to just, I've decided that I'm going to start using they instead of he or she or I've decided to start using ye instead of you, whatever it is. Like there's, there's word choices, there's phrasing choices, there's whole format choices. But again, if you think about how you want to communicate and who you want to communicate to and how you want to, uh, like if you're contributing to a conversation, how you want to contribute to that conversation, do you want to push against the prevailing, uh, you know, the status quo within that conversation? Or do you want to align with it? Do you want to be adjacent to it? There's lots of different ways to communicate. And again, it's about being aware of how you're doing it, making a conscious choice, even if the conscious choice ends up being, I want to write in a really traditional academic format, at least you'll know why you're doing it then and you'll have a better chance of doing it in a way that makes you feel like you've achieved what you want to achieve. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or comments at this point? Just keep an eye on the time. At some point, I'm gonna ask that, okay, you are saying no. At some point, I'm going to ask for questions and comments, and I'm just not going to talk again until somebody actually asks questions. So please be aware of that. But there will there will come a point where somebody has to ask a question. Okay, so when we talk about academic, we can mean um, the formal type of academic publishing in peer reviewed journals for disseminating research. We can also mean all, all the different formal professional education type of writing that we do in academia. Um, I think the thing that academic writing is, is the thing that you will most often be judged on as a researcher, as an academic. If you are working in academia, you will only really be observed by your peers or seniors when you are lecturing, and you will basically never be observed by your peers or, se or seniors when you are doing your field research because they don't want to come with you and they don't want to watch you and they won't spend that much time with you. What they will do is they will read your reports, they will read your proposals, they will read your, I mean like sometimes they'll skim them, but in theory they will read the thing that you write and so will uh, anyone who might give you a job, anyone who might give you a placement, you know, it's, it's how we do almost everything. We do also have like academic conferences and talks and public lectures and la la la. But um, in my experience, there is a lot more of the writing part than the talking part. Um, okay, so real question. Do you feel confident in your academic writing? Do, do the people in this class, you actual people that I'm communicating with right now, do you feel confident in academic writing? Sometimes. Sometimes it's it, sometimes it's challenging, and sometimes yes. though it's um 
uh, I think it's it all depends on on what you're writing about, but most of the time it's not it's not easy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> the struggle it's to find the right words and connecting everything it's it's really tough sometimes yeah i would really agree with that i would really agree with that um somebody asked a question when it comes to academic writing how formal or casual should we write what would you suggest is the perfect medium i can't tell you what is the perfect medium for you because i don't know who you are i don't know what how you want to come across and I don't know what field you're working in or what field you're publishing in. Um, I think that we tend to be taught academic writing should be very formal. So generally speaking, I encourage my students um, to not feel like they have to write it that formally and that they can bring it down a few notches towards schedule. Um, I also tell them that they shouldn't use a uh, slang and they should try to keep it what is like PG-13 you're allowed like one fuck or two shits like <laughs> try not to swear too much is, <laughs> is the uh, uh, general <laughs> concept um, typically you don't really need to swear at all. But I never like to say like, never swear because if it comes up, it comes up, you know, we've all been there. Um, so somewhere in between those two places is is where you need to be. But um, it really does depend on what your, it depends on what your field is, but it mostly depends on how how comfortable you feel with how you're coming across. My other thing that I will say about this though is, do not try to write more formally than you are able to write because that is really obvious to me i i correct a lot of student work um and i read a lot of papers and for both like for everyone from first year undergraduates to you know professors who have been working in the field for 50 60 years like I find it very easy to tell when somebody is when somebody doesn't completely understand how to use a semicolon or what exactly that long word means or how exactly you structure a long sentence or how exactly you use these you know these these like signifiers of formality um like in order to and stuff so if you struggle with that kind of thing, if you haven't engaged with a lot of formal writing in standard English, um, don't, don't overplay your hand there because it comes off as more professional to just keep it simple and straightforward and short sentences and you definitely know how to use all of the words that you're using than it does to try to sound more formal than you are actually able to pull off because you end up sounding like a teenager who doesn't, you know, like a child who doesn't know how to completely talk yet. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I got all of those comments. If you do feel like you are, if you do not feel like you are confident in your academic writing, here are some tips. And if you do feel like you are confident in academic writing, here are some tips that you should definitely pay attention to because there is always a way to improve. And there is sometimes the times when I've felt most confident in my ability to write something or put a speech together have been the times when I ended up uh, fucking it up. So don't uh, <laughs> don't assume that you are if you if you are already good at writing, that's great. Um, don't coast you know <laughs> keep keep improving so the ways to improve your academic writing reading is probably more important even than writing we learn as humans through pattern recognition and if you read lots of things especially lots of things of the type that you want to be writing your brain will naturally learn how to do that even if you don't do a lot of the writing yourself, or even if you don't spend a lot of time deliberately studying grammar. Um, but that's not to say that you, I mean, like the, the most efficient way for you to learn how to write 
good philosophy articles is to read a lot of good philosophy articles. But you can also learn how to write anything by reading a variety of other stuff. So you can take your homework from this class to be that you are allowed to go and read whatever you want to read. Um, because anything and everything can be, you know, useful. As long as it is, as long as it's readable itself. And you no. Know, obviously, if you're just reading tweets, that will just teach you how to tweet. But <laughs> um, if you if like I think a lot of us uh feel like we have time to read or we don't, you know, we don't have time to read the things that we want to read. Um, but actually lots of things are good. So for example, if you like reading newspapers, you like reading newspaper articles, that's really useful for academic writing because a good newspaper article will deliver accurate information in a very short space of, of words, you know? So obviously you have like terrible tabloidy newspapers and they're not gonna be so much help, but um, if you like reading good newspaper articles, read them, that's, that's your homework. Go and read some nice good newspaper articles and if you want to, if you can, pay attention to how they are able to give you a lot of information within the first couple of sentences um, and hopefully, ideally, the information is accurate. <laughs> um, if you like reading fiction and stories and short stories and novels, that's also really useful because um, even when we are writing very technical academic information, the way that we communicate with each other tends to be through stories. And we will even write our lab reports in the form of a story of, you know, here's how it started and here's what we did and here's who was there and here's how it ended. Um, and I mean, like a lab report is gonna be a really, really boring story, but it is still a story. Um, so, <laughs> and if we're writing about, you know, historical figures or writing about, you know, things that are happening, events that are happening, you know, phenomenons, whatever it is, we can, we can learn how to engage an audience and describe the character of a person by reading good fiction. Um, and just keeping up with comments as well. <laughs> Concise writing is so useful and, and good. There, there are We'll, we'll figure out ways to help you get more concise at your writing because I think it's one of the most valuable skills you can learn. If you like reading fan fiction, um, which I do, fan fiction is great because in fan fiction you tag and flag everything. Um, and that is also something we do in academic fiction, no, not academic fiction, academic writing. Um, because in academic writing, you have to say, like we nowadays often put content warnings on stuff, which is great. And we also put, um, we also have to put, we always have put like keywords and, you know, what field is this in? What are the key, what are the keywords? What are the key concepts? What's our, what's the summary of this? And that's all stuff that you will see done really well in the fan fiction community. So genuinely, whatever it is that you like reading, your homework is to go and just read something. Writing is also probably the second most important thing. Um, you will become more comfortable with writing as you do more writing. Um, and again, you don't have to practice writing academically in order to practice writing academically. You could practice writing other stuff. Um, any of the things that you do for writing will help you write generally. Um, even just getting into the habit of sitting down and writing is useful, no matter what you're writing. Um, you know, figuring out how to put sentences together, figuring out how to edit your own work, you know, whatever you like writing, if there is something that you like writing or if there's something you used to like writing, you know, give yourself permission to try that again. Um, editing, we can, we do ourselves a disservice a lot of the time um, by not giving ourselves time to go back over our writing. And like, I was really, I am really that kind of person. Um, I was going to say I was that kind of person, but let's be real, I am still that kind of person. I am not good at giving myself time to go back over things, but I've made a real effort <laughs> in the last few years to at least finish the night before so that I can sleep on it and read it again once in the morning and at least catch the worst of the typos um, so that I come across a little bit more professional than I otherwise would have. <laughs> um, just uh, be aware that for some people, 
you will find yourself doing much, much better if you are able to give yourself time, do like proper rewrites um, and give yourself permission to, to do proper rewrites. Sometimes you feel like I've written this much and I don't want to ruin it by like splitting it up or doing it in a different order or like rewriting it or whatever. Um, if you're worried about that, just start putting sections like copy paste sections into a new document because we're able to do that nowadays. We don't have to do it all on typewriter. Um, but so for some people that will be really useful and you'll you'll see yourself improving a lot if you give yourself time to do that. For other people, that isn't how you write and it's okay. Sometimes we're taught in writing classes or taught in like writing advice that you sh you must write a terrible first draft and then edit it. And that's the only good way of writing. Um, that is not true. And my impression is that that is one of the things that is, it works very well for a lot of neurotypical people, but it doesn't always work for neurodivergent people. Um, so as I am ADHD and um, with significant autistic traits, and I do not work that way at all. My way of uh, writing involves an awful lot of pre-writing build up and figuring out. And then I tend to write a very good first draft. And I felt bad for years that I wasn't doing it the other way that I was, you know, because it, it looks like I'm procrastinating and then writing my first draft and submitting my first draft. And everyone was saying like, your first draft is terrible, you need to edit it and don't procrastinate. But actually I wasn't procrastinating and then submitting a terrible first draft. I was doing pre-writing organization of ideas and then writing a good draft that I didn't have to do very much editing on. And once I became aware of that, I was much better at getting my writing done because I didn't feel like this guilt or this pressure of doing it a way that actually doesn't work very well for me at all. When you are writing, concise writing is really, really useful. Um, actually, fan fiction was one of the things that really helped me with that because there's a thing in fan fiction of writing drabbles where you write a story that are that is literally exactly 100 words long. Um, so if you end up writing the story and it's 98 words long, you have to add two words. But what usually happens is that you write like 143 words and then you have to cut 43 words out. Um, so if that sounds like fun to you, you should you should just try doing that. It doesn't have to be fan fiction. It could just be like a little short story or a little, like try writing a, exactly 100 word diary entry. Um, when you are writing for academic audiences, you will have to fit a lot of writing into those little word count boxes. Um, so like a lot of abstracts will have a word count or, you know, summaries will have a word count or like pre-proposals, expressions of interest. There's a lot of word counts going on. Always listen to those word counts because that is a surefire way <laughs> to piss people off who you actually want to like give you uh, a speaking slot or give you a job or whatever. Um, if you find it difficult to write concisely, you will have to figure out ways of doing your editing. So write long and then one of the things you can do is recognize a lot of us will have filler phrases or phrases that we use that make our sentences longer, completely normal. Um, and yeah, I really feel, I really feel you have <laughs> the, the excessively long introduction. You, you'll get there. Um, it's, it's difficult. And sometimes it is like, how long is a piece of string? Like sometimes your introduction does have to be longer and it's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, we're, Counts. I, I actually find word counts, depending on the situation, um, I hate 500 words. 500 is the worst amount of words. It's too short to get anything actually like properly discussed, but it's long when you're like just trying to give a very brief overview. Anyway, the point is <laughs> some people will be, uh, some people will be able to just write short. And I actually do tend to, to write quite short. My master's thesis was like almost excessively short. Um, other people will need to figure out the ways to cut their own writing down, um, but it is definitely worth the investment. It is really, really worth it. So do do go for that. Um, and sharing. I don't know how much you get to spend 
much time you get to spend with each other or with other people in your classes or your cohort or whatever. I actually don't know how your um your program is organized at all. So I'm not going to tell you how to do this. Um, but if you do have other people that you interact with, whether or not they are studying the same stuff that you're studying, um, if you can share stuff, even to just get a sanity check, even if it's just like your sister who knows nothing about any of this, um, and you can trade her a favor of that she's going to glance through your writing and see if it at least makes sense and she'll probably catch a couple of typos. That's really worth doing and it also will make it more natural and more uh, less scary for you when other people have to wish. Um, so that one is a really hard one, especially because it involves asking for time investment from another human being, um, but it is worth doing if you can. And uh, the swapping thing is great, like, like swap with each other if you can. So everyone has their own best mode, mode of writing, and I already touched on this. Um, so for me, I do, I plan and I think ahead, and then my first draft, I write it reasonably quickly, but not like that, 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 that quickly. Like I, I write it over the course of a couple of hours, um, but like generally in one sitting. And then I mostly just polish it. Every now and then I will realize that I want to move a section or something, but generally speaking, I've already figured out what order all the sections should be in. My brother does a lot of writing and he writes every day. His thing is that he challenges himself to write every day and he has been doing it for years. Um, so he writes at least 200 words every day um, and it's just on whatever. So he might be writing like, you know, a couple of different essays and a paper and a short story and whatever strikes his interest that morning. when he sits down at his desk, he will write a short section of any of those things. And then eventually when it's time to submit them, he'll stick the parts that he's written together or rearrange them or, uh, you know, like if he ended up writing an ending scene that now longer that now no longer connects with the other stuff that he's written, he'll like write bits. That's a really good system. It really works well for him. My PhD supervisor did exactly that thing of you write a really terrible first draft and then you edit it and edit and edit it. Um, and he was really good at sharing it. Like he would share his his stuff. He was very upfront about like, you know, this is not finished. Don't judge me. But like, can you take a look at this and make sure that it's, um, you know, that it's it makes some kind of sense. Um, so those are all perfectly good ways of writing. One of them might work for you. None of them might work for you. You need to figure out what works for yourself. Um, and don't let anyone tell you that that's the wrong way of doing it. Anything that involves you submitting a piece of writing that you are generally happy with and you didn't harm your health to produce it is the right way of doing it. So as long as you are healthy and you are reasonably happy with what you've produced, you have done writing correctly. Don't let anyone else tell you different. I'm gonna give you some suggestions of, um, oh, I'm just gonna reply to comments. Yeah, exactly. Write down whatever, if, like some people do free writing where they literally just like, you just put pen to paper and you just write whatever comes into your head for as long as you can. Um, so any anything at all, whatever way works for you, whatever actually gets words onto paper or words into digital boxes is fine. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm gonna go through some like specific resources that might be useful, um, but does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, I will take the single no as a general no. There are now two no's, three no's. Okay, we'll go. <laughs> um, so if you want help with basics of writing for whatever reason, um, there are lots and lots of different books that you can get. This is the one that my supervisor um, uses. I actually don't use this. Um, but it's because I learned a lot of grammar and stuff when I was younger, so I don't need this kind of uh, resource. If you do need this kind of resource, uh, this is the one that my supervisor recommended. What I like at this is this quote that um, he pulled out of it specifically. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words, a paragraph, no unnecessary sentences, 
for the same reason that a drawing should have no unnecessary lines and a machine no unnecessary parts. This requires not that the writer make all of their sentences short or that they avoid all detail and treat the subjects only in outline, but that every word tell, okay? And the reason that I really like it is because of the two metaphors in it, the drawing and the machine. So when we are writing, sometimes we are writing something that is more like a drawing and sometimes we are writing something that's more like a machine. A lot of the time our academic writing is gonna be more like a machine, um, but it can also be more like a drawing. So when we say that a machine has no unnecessary parts, we literally mean that every single part of the machine is doing a specific actionable job. And that if you add more parts to that machine, you are probably going to break the machine. Like you can't just add extra cogs to a machine because you will they'll literally like jam up. When we are writing technical writing, that's how our writing should work. We are not adding extra words. We are not we're adding, we're only adding the words that we need to convey the technical information. And if we're able to do that, we will produce concise, straightforward academic writing. But sometimes we're writing something that's more like a drawing. We can create, if you say, I'm going to draw a picture of a person, you know, a picture of a ballerina. When you draw a picture of a ballerina, you could produce a picture of a ballerina that's like a circle and some sticks and then like a squiggle for a tutu. That has no unnecessary lines. You have now produced a picture of a ballerina. But usually when we want a picture of a ballerina, we actually want a lot of unnecessary lines compared to how the machine would work. We want lines that would suggest the movement of the ballerina, that would give us an impression of like what shape this ballerina is, what this ballerina is doing, blah, blah, blah. And actually all of those lines are necessary for the job that this drawing is doing, which is like telling a bit of a story about a ballerina and making us happy when we look at this story or sad or, you know, nostalgic or whatever the, whatever it's doing. So when we're writing something that isn't just straightforward technical writing, your unnecessary words are the words that are cluttering things up or adding unnecessary detail, that kind of thing. They're not the words that are adding emotionality or context. Even though we don't always need those words to convey the specific information, if the point of the piece of writing is to do more than convey specific information, but also to give an impression of something that was happening or to communicate something about people, we do need those other lines, the lines that come between, this is a literal depiction of you, you and I now both understand that I've technically drawn a ballerina in this game of charades and a painting of a ballerina that makes you remember when your mother brought you to the, you know, ballet for the first time. So just be aware of that when you are cutting your writing down. It's not about getting rid of every single word that isn't communicating specific information. It's about deciding which words are, and that's what the second part of the quote means. Every word tell, every word should tell something. And it could be specific information, but it could also be emotion and context. And it's just being aware of what you're doing with your words. If you are confused and or enraged by grammar, there are also lots of grammar books. Um, I don't fully recommend any grammar books because almost all grammar books are written by people who take grammar very seriously. And I love grammar. I really like grammar a lot. I like language, I like learning about language, and I like learning languages. So I am like, I have a programmer agenda, but a lot of grammar is taught to us in a prescriptivist way of saying, this is, again, the standard English. This is how English should be or has to be. And if you do something else, you are doing English wrong and you are making a mistake and you are probably stupid. And that is not the way that I prefer to engage with the world. And I don't think it's a very ethical way to engage the world. So if you do want to improve your standard English grammar, be aware when you are reading a book like this that it will tell you things that are true about grammar, but it might tell them to you in a way that makes it seem like that is the only way to communicate when it isn't. And actually, like there are grammatical mistakes you will make 
that will make it more difficult for somebody to understand you. And those ones you should correct. So the thing about like, if you don't know how to use a semicolon, just don't use a semicolon. That because if you put semicolons into a very, very long sentence and you don't actually know exactly what you're doing with them, it becomes much harder for your reader to understand what you're actually trying to tell them. So that's a useful, like that's the kind of grammatical mistake that is useful to correct. <laughs> However, lots of grammatical mistakes or wrong grammar are actually just facets of different uh, English dialects. So for example, Irish, the language Irish has a continuous present. There's a, this is the way that something is. And also this is the way that something is always. This is the way that this is, not, this, this is an ongoing thing. And there's also a copula, which English also doesn't have, which is frustrating. Um, so if I say, you know, so-and-so is at the shop, that means that they are currently at the shop. But I can also say Irish, so-and-so does be at the shop. Like, is frequently at the shop, you probably find them at a shop. Um, and that's really useful. And when Irish people started using English, they started using English and forced to be using English, we continued to have that tense because it's useful. So Irish people will say, does be, he does be at the shop. Obviously, if you write that, Lynn Truss would correct your grammar um, and weirdly aggressively, she would do it weirdly aggressively. Um, but actually that's not a mistake and it's not something that Irish people will, like if my, if my daughter who is three says like, he do be at the shop, that's a grammatical mistake because she hasn't figured out the, like he does, they do thing. But if she says he does be at the shop, that's not a grammatical mistake because she's using Hiberno-English correctly. So just be aware that you might have valid grammatical constructions that are in a dialect that will be classified as incorrect based on standard grammar, but that are perfectly correct. And I believe, I don't know because I'm, I'm not from the US and not very uh, up on all of this stuff, but I believe that an American vernacular English has a similar um, tense thing with the continuous or yeah, continuous tense. So don't let Lynn trust us. Um, I like this one because they're all like this. They're all prescriptivist, but at least Lynn trust is having fun. Um, so that's <laughs> that's my uh, that's my thing with it. But um, it does it comes with a big disclaimer on it for me. Um, this one, I also, I, this one doesn't work for me at all, but it works so well for my supervisor. Um, and he talked about it so much that I still include it because if it works for you, like it works for my supervisor, it will change your life. Um, so if it doesn't work for me, I still share it. Um, and it's useful because it's specifically about academic writing. Um, so this is a system for making like schedules and goals for how to write a lot of academic writing, write productively and produce the kind of academic writing you want to produce. Um, if this doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean that you're lazy or doing it wrong. It just means it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for me. And I still write a lot of academic writing. It's fine. But if it does work for you, it might be really useful. So um, if you want to read something that's a bit more ready, fun to read, um, Stephen King's memoir is actually like a writing advice book um, as well. And he agrees with me, or I suppose I agree with him, um, about like reading and writing are the two most important things to actually improve your own writing. Um, it's also a really interesting book and it has dramatic car crash and stuff. It's like pretty fascinating. So um, that is one of the ones that I did read and enjoy and use. Um, if you need something that's less self-directed, if you don't think you're actually going to read something by yourself, um, there are loads and loads of writing workshops and classes. A lot of them are online these days. Um, do be aware that 
some of them will tell you that you're doing things wrong and some of them won't click with you. And that's not a reflection on you or necessarily even a reflection on them. It just means that everyone is different. Um, and especially if you're neurodivergent, um, you know, don't feel bad if the advice doesn't click with you or that if you can't figure out ways to implement the advice, it just means that the advice isn't for you. It's okay. Um, and especially if you are neurodivergent, I don't know what the story is um, at your university, but, or in your country generally, but the universities that I've worked in have all had specific supports available for students with disabilities on top of whatever general writing supports there are. And I don't, again, I don't know how it works for you, but for us, if you have, if you're registered as having any kind of disability, you can access any of the disability support services. Um, so if that is, if that does apply to you, just see what you are entitled to. Um, if there is something that you can claim, you should, because it's there for you, you should use it. Um, good, okay, somebody said it is somewhere here. Okay, so uh, we are going to now talk about academic publishing. It is half 10. Do you want to take like a two minute break? Like, a, okay, it's, it's like, take a four minute break and come back at half past, just like stretch your legs. Okay. Okay. I am just going to start at half past because I can't see whether you're here or not. So quick break, quick break. <laughs> I will also be back in one second.
Okay, I'm gonna get going again. <clears throat> I'll just assume you're all here. Is anyone here? We're all here. Great. <laughs> okay, so academic publishing. Thank you. Uh, you're gonna talk a bit about the academic publishing um, industry. The I'm talking more specifically about science publishing industry because that's what I have more experience with, but um, it does apply generally, most of it does apply generally to the like research publishing industry. Um, okay, so peer review is a, in theory, organized method for evaluating scientific work. Um, this system is used by scientists to certify the correctness of procedures. Did you use the correct methodology? Establish the plausibility of results. The results likely to be accurate. And it's also used to allocate resources. Um, so, but in terms of peer review will decide which articles get published in a given journal, and also the number of peer reviewed articles that it academic producers um, is likely to have an effect on their ability to get research funds and uh, positions, that kind of thing. So in traditional academic publishing, um, universities generally and other research institutions pay salaries to the people who work there. Um, that would include people who are writing academic articles, people who are doing the reviewing for academic articles, and people who are reading academic articles. Some readers will be outside of the university or research um, structure. In this system, the author down in the corner produces a piece of work and submits it to an academic press. The academic press then publishes the work and the universities, uh, research institutions and individual readers pay to access that piece of work. The piece of work is peer reviewed. The reviewer, so the reviewer is also doing work, do the work of reading it and producing a review of it. Both the original work, the piece of work itself, the article itself, the author writing the article and the reviewer reviewing the article, they both do not get paid for that work. In theory, they're getting paid a salary by the university. As we continue into this capitalist hellscape, it's increasingly the case that the people who are writing academic articles are not paid salaries or comfortable salaries by the universities, um, but are on short-term contracts, um, no contracts, you know, they don't have the kind of stability that academic researchers tended to have, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And it's different in different countries. Um, it has changed much more sharply in the US than it has in Ireland because Ireland used to be more poor than, uh, you know, Ireland is still obviously much smaller than the US, um, but you know, like 20 or 30 years ago when my mother was a uh, junior academic, there were also very few well-paying academic jobs. Um, whereas my partner's parents, when they were in academia in the US, there was a, a good expectation that you could get a good job and a good salary and, you know, establish a family and la la la. So it has changed a lot more sharply in the US than it has in Ireland, but it has changed all over the world and not for the better. Anyway, the point is that uh, the author has done work, the reviewer has done work, the press is publishing the work, the readers, whether they are the whole university or individual readers, pay the press for access to the work, the author and the reviewer do not get any money for the work that they've done. People didn't think this was very good because the main problem here is that you need money to be able to access the published work. And that means that if you don't have um, access to, you know, like if, if you're not a part of a university that has, that's able to pay the press or you're not part of a university at all, you don't get access to you know, recent work in your field, and then you can't, uh, you can't establish yourself in your field because you need to be able to see what else is going on in your field in order to be able to operate within it successfully. 
So we have started to move towards um, open access publishing where the readers in the university access to the work free, but the publishing company still wants to make a profit. So the author pays the press to publish the, so you, you pay an open access fee. Some major um, journals will now have like two streams. They'll have a traditional publishing and an open access publishing. Um, some are entirely one way or the other. This is in theory a slight improvement in that you no longer have to be a, you know, a member of a established and sufficiently wealthy university in order to get access to information. But it also means that it's becoming harder and harder for the larger and larger amount of academics who don't have proper institutional backing or proper salary to be able to publish their work in the first place. Um, so both of these systems are very exploitative. Um, and the publishing company is like, especially more recently, it used to be that they needed a lot of money to be able to publish, like you would publish like physical journals. They, you know, they would operate like a, like a magazine company, basically like the, they would have those kind of overheads. Nowadays, a lot of publishing companies just publish online. Um, so they have like, they're running a server and a small staff, but they're still charging the same kind of fees and the same kind of access fees and the same kind of open access fees. Um, and consequently, consequently, um, scientific publishing is a huge business. It has uh, enormous revenues. It's insanely profitable. Um, like Elsevier is one of the big ones. Um, its scientific publishing uh, arm had a 36% margin of profit in 2010, which is like a ridiculous amount of money. And this isn't like this isn't stuff that people are just doing because it's fun. This is ideally, you know, which is also exploitive because people deserve to have fun, but this is something, this is like research on, you know, education, on health, on like scientific breakthroughs, on physics, stuff that people like ideally should have access to and should be able to share without it being part of this huge capitalist system of creating a profit off of it. Um, the background of this is that this guy, Robert Maxwell, um, who's a really, really strange life story, uh, was born in what was Czechoslovakia um, and is now in Ukraine. Oh, sorry. Computer problem. I'm back. <laughs> he fought for the British in World War II, but may have been some kind of double or triple spy. Um, so who knows what's going on there? But he became, he fought for the British in World War II and got his citizenship, became very rich. He bought butter with Springer. Um, Springer is still one of the big publishers, founded Pergamon Press. Um, he owned the Daily Mirror, he owned MTV. Um, he was a politician. Um, and he was the one who really pioneered uh, this, this kind of publishing model. Um, and really pushed his publisher, publishing companies to be as profitable as possible. Um, his body was found near his yacht, the Lady Ghislaine. Um, if Ghislaine Maxwell sounds familiar to you, it is because it is that Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, she somehow managed to be even worse and is still only the third worst person in that photo, but um, that is, that's the family. <laughs> um, so the solution to this uh there's now a movement rather than open access there's a movement towards open scholarship um with the idea being that universities themselves or like you know community like academic communities can publish their own research um i actually have a really good article i didn't add it to the slides uh i forgot that it was the slides but i'll send it to leah that she can send on about working outside of the traditional academic publishing um system so my university that I've been PhD in um, has an open scholarship program. So for example, all of our PhDs are now published on open access repository and uh, you can publish stuff on that open access repository. Obviously like within a system that still privileges 
like peer reviewed articles, when you work outside of that, you will lose out on things, you know, so if you are publishing things that are not in peer reviewed articles, a lot of places when you're applying for jobs will ask you not, you know, how much work have you put in or what have you found out or do your students learn stuff from you, they will ask how many peer reviewed articles have you published and what are the metrics on those articles have people signed up them and stuff so really we need to dismantle the entire academic publishing industry um i really like this xkcd cartoon of we have received your manuscript the bizarre economics of academic publishing why volunteer peer reviewers should rise up and demand payment for for-profit journals we have elected not to send it out for review um because at the moment everyone who works with the system gets the benefits of working with the system. And if you work outside of the system, you don't get those benefits and nobody hears when you say anything. So but that means that by the time you're in a position to change the system, you are the person that bought into the system and benefited from the system and it now no longer benefits you to change the system. And that's how a lot of these systems get perpetuated um, across you know, lots of sociopolitical things and across capitalism generally. Um, so if you can, if you end up being a person who does succeed within the system, which will be partly luck, regardless of who you are, then when you get into a position where you do have a little bit of power, try to remember what it's like to not have power and the choices that you had to make to get there and why you made those choices and the reasons that other people may not have been able to make the same choices as you. You're right, Victoria, it's not fair. <laughs> okay, and um, unfortunately there is worse still because there are also, now that there's the system of open access scholarship where you can get a peer reviewed journal article published and it's open for everyone to be able to read it, um, but you can pay, and I mean like the fees for open access can be anywhere from like a few hundred euro to thousands of euro. Like you can pay thousands of euro for these, especially in the big, um, are uh, big journals. Um, there has now become this, this problem of predatory publishers who set up open access journals, um, but they don't, um, you know, like they, they don't give you any editing, they don't give you any, um, they don't give, a lot of them won't even give you proper peer review, they just say that it was peer reviewed, but they don't actually like do the proper peer review process um, because they just want you to pay them a few hundred euro or a thousand euro to publish your article and all they're running is like a little server like they're basically running a website like um this person Jeffrey Biel um was running a, a blog where he was calling them out um both predatory publishing journals that were like not real journals or were taking advantage of people and also just like bad practice um like this homeopathy journal um, so he was listing thousands of exploitative or deceptive um, publishing, you know, journal publishing companies and journals. Um, at a certain point in 2016, 2017, um, he suddenly put the blog down and said that he couldn't give any reasons why and declined to make any comments. Um, maybe it was a personal thing, but I am inclined to believe that if somebody is calling out a big powerful industry and they suddenly stop that there could be something else going on um a definite and worse example is aaron schwartz who was one of the co-founders of reddit um and he was a huge advocate for open access publishing um he had this whole open access manifesto um and his version of open access was like proper open access like he didn't want it to be that this this thing of you pay to create open access so it would be what he was talking about, we would now call open scholarship. Um, he was heavily, heavily prosecuted for fraud for downloading articles um, at his university um, and he committed suicide. So it's like, it's it's a real, like sometimes we think about it as like this, this distant thing or this thing that's like frustrating. Um, but it's actually a huge, powerful industry that's protecting itself. Um, and it's, like scary, you know? Um, Alexandra Albakian is called the pirate queen of science, which is 
absolutely the best name you could possibly have. Um, she created this website called SciHub um, because she was based in um, Kazakhstan and was not able to access, like in theory, if you're, you're working at a university, you're, um, you know, the idea is that you have access to all of these things for without having to pay yourself. Um, but in practice, you know, that was for well-established US and European and, you know, certain other countries, um, universities, um, and a lot of countries, your university doesn't have the kind of money to, to give you access to things. So she was uh, really frustrated about not being able to access scientific information that she wanted to get access to, to be able to like progress her own research. So she started writing like, little codes that would get around paywalls um, and then automated that process and put it up as a website. So you can go to SciHub and like, it will generally give you access to a lot of, a lot of places. Um, Sorry, you, I just, uh, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can also access a lot of what you can get through SciHub through uh, LibGen. Oh, cool. That's just a libgen.org is another place. That can... Yeah. Um, so, oh, I still have this to say TCD library. That's your own library, <laughs> whoever you are. Um, SciHub changes top level domains. So I tend to just Google SciHub and then I use SciHub so much. I use SciHub more than my institutional library half the time because uh, it's really hard to log into my institutional life <laughs> uh, sometimes. Um, Sometimes if you just put the paper, it comes up. Um, also, theoretically, authors are not allowed to share the published version of the paper with you, but they are allowed to share the last draft of it with you. Um, and generally speaking, authors are really, really nice about that. So if you if there's something that you can't get access to, if you email the author, they tend to be like, people, people want their research to be read and, uh, you know, they want to connect with other researchers working in the same field, so reach out. Okay, we are now going to talk a little bit about, oh, does anyone have any questions based on that section? It is politics. Everything's politics, unfortunately. It's a, it's a socio-political issue. Okay, we're going to talk about creative nonfiction um, and then talk about my thesis. Uh, yeah. All right. So creative nonfiction is using the techniques that you would use for fiction, um, but you're using it to tell a true story instead of a fictional story. So examples of creative nonfiction are things like memoirs and journals. Um, I don't know if you ever have the like like long reads is that a thing like journalist like journalistic essays in newspapers that like tell a story about a particular thing like, like deep dive maybe I don't know what the I don't know what the terminology is here <laughs> um uh examples of people who write nonfiction, um like Bill Bryson Rebecca Stute Hope Yaron there's loads and loads of really good creative nonfiction writers a lot of it tends to be like travel and memoir. They tend to be like the big ones, but there's like all sorts of uses of creative nonfiction. Um, when we are writing, when we are writing something like fiction or stories or like personal essays or whatever, we tend to write in first person, active voice, present tense. We tend to use, um, depending on what it is, we'll, we'll often use short sentences or like straightforward sentences. When we're like rewriting or writing our journals, we tend to write longer sentences. But if we're like telling us, we're writing a little story, we tend to write shorter sentences. When we write academically, um, it kind of, it, it could often look more like this. We're using third person, passive voice, past tense. We're assigning an epithet to ourselves. Um, we're using these long sentences, lots of jargon, lots of like complicated grammatical constructions um, and citing. And I think it's really important to be aware of which conventions in academic writing are there because they're useful and you know lend something to the format and which ones are just there because that's been an established convention for 
questionable reasons and we don't actually have to conform to it. So for example, in academic writing, you're supposed to reference everything. You know, if you quote somebody or paraphrase somebody, you reference who that person was and when they wrote it. That's really useful. And when we are introducing a concept for the first time or an acronym for the first time, we spell out what it is or what it means. That's really useful. Writing in third person or writing in passive voice, especially writing about our own research actions in third person passive voice, is just a convention that was adopted from like physics, basically, where, you know, in physics, in theory, <laughs> it doesn't matter who was in the room or who carried out the experiment. The idea is that the physics experiment should be the same every time in every place. Um, I still think it's worth saying who was in the room just for, you know, other reasons, meta reasons, but, you know, grammatically, it's less important. For that to have then been adopted outwards through almost all types of academic writing, even though in most forms of academic writing, it does matter who is in the room, it does matter who's talking. A physics experiment might be the same no matter who carries it out, but like an interview definitely won't be at all. You know, school observations won't be. Um, even pharmacology studies won't be. If there's, if there's people in the room, it's going to be different depending on who people are. So putting the researcher outside of the research by using third person and passive voice um, is just a grammatical convention for the purposes of this idea of objectivity that is not useful in a lot of cases and actively harmful in a lot of cases. So be aware of which things are useful and which things are not useful, which things you want to continue to perpetuate and which things you maybe don't want to continue to perpetuate. And this kind of dense prose that's favored by a lot of academic journals, um, like it, it puts people off. It, it makes people uh, less likely to engage with. Like, I don't, I don't think I've ever met anyone who like, actively enjoys reading traditional academic writing. Like, even people who really enjoy their uh, their field and their and really like finding out new information about their field tend to get a bit exasperated when it's written in a really dense way or written with a lot of jargon. Um, but certainly, people from non traditional backgrounds, people from uh, you know technical backgrounds or professional backgrounds, you know, so for example, a lot of my students are teachers, like teachers of children. Um, years of children and teenagers who are coming back to do a master's or looking at maybe doing a PhD. Um, so they don't always feel, and I mean like teachers are obviously a group of people who are reasonably in theory highly educated, you know, if you're working with, uh, you know, like if you're doing engineering research and you're working with like technicians or something that might have uh, a less like word heavy or language heavy background you know like you might be working with a technician who knows a huge amount of information and is highly educated in a certain way but is not highly educated in like reading or like complicated uh, uh complicated language stuff may not have done may not have written or read essays since they were a teenager but they're like you know they would know a huge amount about engineering, they would know a huge amount about what they're doing and uh, they're not going to engage with academic writing if it's going to take them ages to read it and it's complicated and it makes them feel like they're doing it wrong. Um, but we have this idea of like writing about our research in a certain level of academic way is the only acceptable way of doing it, um, which I find really off-putting. Um, and I find it really off-putting and I'm like, you know, a hyper literate nerd who like loves reading stuff. So when I was approaching my PhD, I thought about like, how would we break this a little better, make it work for me a little bit better. Um, and the first reason that I wanted to do this was for myself. Um, so a reason that you might go outside of the bounds of traditional academic writing is because you might want to write 
because writing is nice actually and it's fun it can be fun it's a hobby it's a thing people do on purpose for fun um and when I started my PhD I remember like talking to older PhD students or like more senior PhD students and so many of them would say like oh, I'm fine on writing I have to do some writing this weekend and I really don't want to and I was thinking you know it's it's the thing that you like you have to write your thesis you have to write papers you have to write proposals you have to write so much stuff um and I'm gonna have to write so much even just the thesis even if I didn't have to write anything else I'm gonna have to write this like 80,000 word document over the next four years and if I hate writing every single one of those 80,000 words I'm gonna go completely mad like I'm just really not going to be able to do this but writing is a hobby and it was my hobbies you know um and I feel like I felt like there must be a way to like make that work for me um and I found this thesis uh written by Piper Alexis Aaron who's a mathematician uh, and she wrote her thesis in this really fun way of every section of her thesis was divided into three parts and the first part would be written like for a lay audience so if she was like at the pub with her friends who are not mathematicians um and they said what are you doing it would be that version of it so the first part was that version of it the second part was she was like at a you know university event with other like academics how would she describe it and like the kind of academic the traditional academic way of describing it and then the third part would be if she was back at the pub but this time with her like hardcore mathematician friends what are the like what's the really nitty-gritty stuff that she's really into that like you you would talk about in like jargon and complicated ways but like enthusiastically <laughs> um so every section had those three parts to it um and she said like you could just read the whole thesis by just going through and reading all the first parts uh and you would get an idea of what I was doing so what really struck me about it was this is from her like introduction um you know it is my art it is myself her thesis was something that she was able to write for herself and by herself and it was like an expression of who she was not just a collection of the work that she had done over a few years but like a, a way of showing what kind of mathematician she was and what kind of person she was um to reflect back to how we where we started yourself and also your audience especially if you want your academic writing or your want your writing you know whatever you're, you're writing in your field to reach people who are not academics you need to think about how you would write that and uh, what might be useful to do um and that was one of the things one of the other things that really struck me from Piper Alexis Harren was you know when you're reading a paper and you're like oh my goodness what does this mean what does any of this mean why can't they just say what they mean and I don't want to do that to the next person, you know, like I don't want to, uh, I have been that frustrated person so many times and I hope to not be that frustrating person to the next person who's trying to read about what I'm doing. Um, another one that I found who is uh, Lisa Maria Riley was um, an alumna of my university, Trinity, um, a few years ahead of me. Um, she wrote her thesis, she was a national student who had returned to education and was doing her PhD on the experiences of non-traditional students within the university um, and like the emotionality of that experience. Um, and she wrote her thesis as a, like, like a memoir. Like it's, it's like a story about a woman called Lisa who was doing her PhD um, and the thesis is the last year of her PhD. So, you know, the, the introduction is like, Lisa and it's written in third person like a novel you know like so like Lisa crossed the road and, and answered her phone and the introduction is she answers the phone to her sister and her sister is like saying okay I, I read over the stuff that you sent me for your PhD to like to proofread it but I actually don't understand what it is that you're talking about can you explain it to me um so you get the impression of her thesis through dialogue you know and it's like reading a novel um like a slightly weird, you know, <laughs> kind of accidentally dense novel, but like it's still a it's a story. It's really cool. Like it's it's interesting to read. Um and again to reflect back to the start, what are your values? 
So for Lisa Marie Riley, she was writing about the emotionality, the emotions of the university classroom for non-traditional students. She really didn't want to, like one of the things she was discovering was how they felt, they often felt alienated within that space. And she didn't want to contribute to that, especially because she was one of those people who would sometimes feel alienated in that space. So she wrote her thesis in a way that was more accessible or more like familiar to people like her, because that was part of what her research was about, you know? Um, and another really cool example I found um, was a paper by Catherine Carroll, who wrote, uh, she was researching breast milk donation. So uh, she was interviewing women who expressed milk and sent it to a donor bank, and also parents who had a baby in need of donated breast milk, um, you know, who are looking after their newborn or receiving the donor milk. The way that the donation system is set up is that the donors and the parents who need the milk never interact. But she found that both of them would sometimes write notes or cards and send them to the, uh, to the breast milk bank. Um, and in the course of like, she read those notes and cards and she like spoke to a lot of people who were involved and she decided to write the paper rather than just writing it out and having quotes from the women. She wrote it as though it was a set of letters between a hypothetical donor and a hypothetical mother um, who were able to like, imagine if they could send letters to each other, what would they say based on her research? Um, and it's really beautiful. And it shows you not only what those women were, you know, like the, the like, information about the kind of experiences they were having but also like how they expressed themselves and how they felt about it and stuff and that all comes through much more um viscerally when you like when you're reading it like a like a story like a like these women are right like you're reading their actual letters um you could also have academic research that includes other elements um often the examples I would find of these ones are in the creative arts, you know, so like this uh, one by Shaw, um, no minds, it is, it's a rap, his thesis is written as a rap and it's a bad rap. Um, or Nick Sassani's, um thesis is written as a graphic novel. It's about graphic novels. Um, I really like that one because like the point of his thesis was that there are things that you can express through a graphic medium that you can't express through prose. If you just tell someone that through prose, it's not as convincing as if you actually show them. So I thought that, that one was really cool. Um, so on the topic of epistolaries, because that's what the letters back and forth were, um, the idea of an epistolary thesis would be a series of documents which, when you read them together, they form a narrative of the research. Um, so a thesis that was an epistolary thesis would take you through the research from start to finish through a series of documents that you would read, like letters and papers and emails and stuff. Um, and the real strength of an epistolary is that if you, if you get engaged with an epistolary, you feel like you're in that world. Um, so has anyone read Dracula? The actual novel Dracula. I think I've watched the movie. Fair. Okay, I highly recommend reading Dracula, um, the book. Um, and if you read Dracula the book, try to imagine when you're reading it, that you do not know what a Dracula is because at the time, like, Breaststroke made up that name, you know, like it's, you didn't actually know what was happening. Um, now, obviously, we've got a fairly good concept of what Dracula is. Um, <laughs> but when you're reading it, um, the actual novel isn't just written as a novel, you know, like a dialogue and prose. It's written as diary entries and journal entries and newspaper articles written by the characters within the novel. 
Um, and when you're reading it, then it feels like it's real. Like you're, you, you found a collection of notes and letters and, and journal entries from real people, you know, and it takes you through the story and you're following along with the characters as the story is unfolding. Um, and when I was starting out on my PhD, at some point I read Dracula um, and Bram Stoker is Irish, by the way, as well. So that's an extra reason. Um, and I really like that kind of classic the horror stuff. So I was reading Dracula and uh, at the same time I was thinking about how I didn't want to write a traditional thesis and I didn't like the idea of writing everything in third person and all of this stuff. And I decided that I would try out the idea of writing a epistolary thesis instead, where rather than a story about Dracula, this epistolary would be a story about the research being carried out and that I like ideally it would take the reader through the process as though because it was real so as though it was real <laughs> um so my thesis looks a bit like this it has fictionalized exam papers and a zine and it has some poems and letters and chat logs and annotated um research instruments and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, um, but first of all, we're going to have a short break, and at this point, I do want people to ask questions. <laughs> um, so we'll stop here for one minute and see if anyone has any questions, and then we're going to have like five minute break, okay? So does anyone have any questions? Silence means no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, will we come back at a quarter past? Is that okay? Or do you want to take 10 minutes? We come back at 20 past? Um, yeah. Uh, or we can, no, I think that, I think that 10 minutes and then we'll have, yeah, a little bit like, like 10 or 20 minutes for Q and A that works. Yeah. Cool. When does this class finish? 11.40. 11.40, okay. All right, so you'll come back at 20 past, and then we have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Cool. Cool. Um, oh, Emily, oh, sorry. Yes. Would you, are you okay with uh, sending me the PowerPoint that you have, or are you still? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Because then I'll I'll post it on Blackboard for everybody. I had some people that were asking me for it. So. Yeah, I'll add the um that essay as well that I meant to add. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Um yeah, that's no problem. I was gonna say something and I forget what it was. Who knows? Maybe it'll come back. It probably will. If it was important, it will. Okay. All right. So we'll be back at 1120. Yep. interaction. My thesis opens with the first time I met my supervisor, but I wrote it as though it was a email exchange instead of a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, because it's my thesis, um, I wrote everything myself. Um, so there's letters and emails and chat logs that are from other people, but I wrote all of them like as in those people's voices. Um, so it has emails back and forth between my supervisor, like establishing what the, what it was going, what my project was going to be. Um, and then like, 
an excerpt from the proposal that I wrote about uh, to get my funding. Um, and then like some short stories about different things that I did, my research instrument with like annotations of how I created it. Um, but one of the things that I really put a lot of effort into is that there are a few poems in the thesis. Um, and I'm going to share one of the poems with you. This poem is right at the end of the thesis. It kind of takes the place of like research or reflection. Um, and it's about how I changed or my own view of myself as a researcher. Um, and I'm sharing it because I, I like it, I'm proud of it, but also because I think it's a good example of the kind of thing that could be in a thesis, both in terms of you, know, you don't have to write things in the traditional way, you could write them in a different way, including a very, very different way, like a poem. And also, sometimes we get told to minimize ourselves in our academic work. Um, and sometimes that's fine. Like there's there's papers and stuff that I've written or been part of writing that don't have a huge amount to do with me. But my thesis did have a huge amount to do with me. And the way that it was created was because of who I am as a person. So I'm going to share the poem with you um, and then just briefly wrap up with my thesis itself. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A and I have like some suggestions of other things that I could um, like answer questions on, or we can just talk about the stuff that we have talked about, whatever suits, okay? So my poem is called Word by Word. I'm gonna close the chat box while I'm doing this so that I can concentrate, but I'll open it again. How does a research student, trying not to lose the momentum, precarious in a scary rush to finish up during a global catastrophe, kind of catch some sleep, find the time to rhyme a line about her process? So, when I was maybe four years old, I thought about it hard and told my mother that someday I'd be Professor Emer. Listen to me. She said I'd need a PhD. A winding path from physics to geology, a half turn back seismology, and sideways to where I'm meant to be, a science education degree. Begun in the summer of 2016, that year everything seemed to split into before and after. Do you remember it? Pokemon Go on every phone screen, EU's crisis of refugees to admit, and Britain and the US going to make historically questionable decisions. But I started this. This journey, this learning, this fire I set burning for all or for naught at 26, unmarried, childless, and neurotypical, I thought. Ready for four years or a while less. A first paper, intentions, a wedding and honeymoon, opportunities, summer schools, forgetting, remembering, delays and fits and starts and slog, tears and laughter, the odd blog, finding a place in the arts and humanities, finding a way to deal with a pregnancy, Meanwhile, I get diagnoses by degrees and clutter myself with stress and anxieties, but I started this as a positivist, positively, passionately restricted, certain, stiff, but brittle, but I learned to stick with this discomfort little by little, the seduction of the ductile, constructing a conversation and exploring philosophy. Turns out I'm a philosopher. A whole new world of ontological puzzles. I love it. I define myself within pragmatism as I find my self-created baggage isn't a failing, ignoring it is. I can bring my whole person to this. And I did. And I'm a perfectionist, but I know that flaws are inevitable in research doubly so. All we can do is note and learn, go with the flow and try our best to earn wisdom to bring whatever next we go. And here I am. See, they noticed I was gifted when I was pretty small. They noticed lots about me, but they didn't notice all. I am a girl become a woman whose attention definitely has directionality. So 
What is it to be 30, third degree, interrogating, waiting, third generation, lucky looking, weighing downs and ups and oops and luck and getting stuck? And look, the path between the trees, the seeking weeds, the thawing trees, that ease us very soft and slow, release us all at once and know, I will not come this way again. A sharp spring day, a breath of air, crying disbeliever's prayer. I cannot come this way again. I walk back home. I raise my pen or touch the keys. Word by word, tapped out. But sometimes that one's all too many come flooding too fast to catch. So how does a writer, am I a writer? Who is a writer? A night or two of panicked queries, half remembered theories. But listen, this is how it goes. Everything changes us, sometimes a lot. And I don't know what I am till I see what I wrote. So how does an all or nothing young man, pale and sickly, all go too fast, too slow, bimodal researcher, queer as any folk, feminist, fed up of this, obsessed with the poetry of prose, and now a mammy on top of it, keep going? Word by word. Okay, let me get the chat back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> oh. That was really nice. I really loved it. It's a play of words and it's wow. I I am I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted. Thank you. I almost used up my fucking. I I put that was fucking amazing. And then Hayden. I said, I don't know if that was the right time to use it. And then all Hayden. I would have left were two shits. <laughs> but it was, it was, I mean, literally amazing. I need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm delighted. Uh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, if you want to more of my thesis or more of my poems, uh, my thesis is on the GCD Open Scholarship um the open access repository so if you search for my name and tara t-a-r-a um t-a-r-a how do you pronounce that letter because this is this has hit me before we pronounce it or t-a-r-a oh r yeah. r that's how i pronounce it right. <laughs> um Okay, so my my brief, my wrap up, my advice from writing my really weird, fun, alternative ADHD, strange thesis, um, oops, is, uh, and this is who I am. I'm I'm creative. I'm a poem. I'm disabled. I'm a feminist. I'm queer. I'm ADHD. I'm a writer. I'm a geologist. I'm a storyteller. I'm a parent now. I'm an artist. Um, and I have done a poem, so very briefly, I've already told you about my thesis format as well. We've talked about language and structure. Um, so I'll just give you my tips. Um, that's my thesis, we've done that. Um, it's only murder. If you wanna do something really, really different, it's murder if there's intent. Don't just do a bunch of stuff that's not the way that you've been taught. You have to be intentional about what you're gonna do. Um, if there's no intent, it's just manslaughter. Don't manslaughter your thesis. Um, make sure you do your research. Uh, when I was doing my crazy thesis, I looked at, I read through, for some reason, Trinity keeps all of its academic regulations in a thing called the calendar. Um, the calendar is like 300 pages long. So I read all of the parts of the calendar that applied to theses and made sure that there was nothing in there that said that I couldn't do. And everything in my thesis down to like the font size and the margins are exactly within the, you know, the stuff that Trinity says is required for theses, but actually those requirements are pretty general and there's nothing that says that you can't write weird poems. Um, do self-reflect, oh, I'm really glad to hear this. This came at such a time in your life. That's that's amazing. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. I'm fucking delighted. <laughs> Make sure you discuss what you're gonna do. Um, like it's useful to me to like, to have people be like, you're doing what? Why? How would that work? And be able to like explain it. Um, but do trust yourself. If there's something that you really want to do, something that feels right for you, 
uh, you're the only person who knows what's right for you. Sometimes you won't know what's right for you, but when you do know what's right for you, you're the only person that can tell you yourself. Um, and you can have fun with it. So the, the discuss and done thing, I had four people that I talked to a lot of pieces um, and it was very useful to have this grid of people. So I had people who were involved and people who were not involved, people who were really dubious about this whole project and people who were really excited about this whole project. So the top two people are my two co colleagues, my two best friend colleagues from my PhD, my supervisor who was involved, but very dubious about it and was like, you wanna do a what? Please don't please do a normal thesis that I can actually supervise and give you input in. Um, and I had to like convince him and that was really useful. Meanwhile, my uh, friend Laura, who worked with us in our research group, she was really involved, but she was just like, yeah, do it, do whatever you want. You can like, you can crush this. And that was really useful. My mother, who is also an academic, um, who was not involved with my project was really dubious. Like she spends all of her time teaching her students like how to write proper academic lab reports for biochemistry and was like, what, why are you doing this? How are you pull it off? How are you going to make sure that you're actually going to get through it okay? Um, and meanwhile, my best friend in the world, uh, who came to New York with me actually, um, also not involved, but was so excited. And everything I showed her, she was like, wow, that's amazing. Wow, I love poems. Wow, this is like, I've never seen this before. So that's what I recommend. I don't know if you can set up such a very useful grid yourself, but if you can, absolutely do it. Um, uh, my tips are, the same, you know, read a lot, write a lot, edit a lot. We already did this, cut a lot and share a lot. But my survival tips um, for students, and this is this is specifically for postgrad students, but it applies to everyone. Um, my political tip is to be kind. That doesn't mean nice. You don't have to be nice. Uh, you don't have to be polite necessarily, but be kind. Uh, the kind of kindness that might be angry and might be stubborn. Be deliberate, be listening to people. Um, go out of your way to help each other because that's that's all we have. Um, my practical tip is again to read, but specifically, I don't know if you were ever told to like read the exam question and answer the exam question exactly what they ask you for. That continues to apply to everything in life. <laughs> and you will seem like you are so smart and so good at getting funding if you are actually able to like, answer the specific question, make it easy for people to give you marks, make it easy for people to, to just take off whatever you're asking for. Uh, also read the instructions. There's always a coffee machine. Nobody ever knows how to read. You can just Google that coffee machine, find the instructions, read it, and then you will seem like the smartest person in the world. Um, my personal tip is to prioritize your health and well-being. Um, when I was an undergraduate student, I got really sick and I just kept pushing through um, and I kept going to class. I didn't take them off and it absolutely wrecked me for like a decade like I was not right for ages and ages afterwards especially in this kind of situation where we have like we're just coming out of a global pandemic there will probably be other pandemics uh due to climate change you can get extensions on everything else you can find ways around everything else you cannot get your health back you cannot get your youth back so please do take care of yourself you deserve to be taken care of and sometimes you're the only person who's going to be able to take care of yourself um so uh we don't have very much time yet because i, I told you too long at all points in my life um but i can also hang around for a few minutes at the end <laughs> i'm not rushing off um so please feel free to ask me anything reasonable um i have lots of things that i do these are some of the things that i do um i don't know why one of those bubbles says surviving i don't remember why i wrote that but um i will attempt to give you advice on surviving if i can but please ask me questions about any of the stuff that we've talked about or any of these other things. I am you say, oh, I'm sorry, yes. go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you no, no, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna just stay here until somebody asks something. So please go ahead. <laughs> um, it, when you put reasonable, um, it would be unreasonable to have you um, help me with my final exam in this class, right? That would not be illegal, right? <laughs> I, I think it would be illegal. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> then I have no questions. Oh, well. <laughs> I think all I can do with your final exam is tell you to read the question. <laughs> Leah agrees. <laughs> yeah, I tend to kind of, I don't know, um, I skim over it and never, I never read them properly. I don't no, no, no. Take, take a deep breath just like yourself underline them if they're if they're physical or highlight them if they're digital 
Like, do, do not let yourself write anything down until you have underlined all of the words in the question. Victoria, do you have your hand up? Um, yes, I um, thank you so much for this insightful and um, educate, like I, I, I don't have the, the right vocabulary, but it's been very, um, I'm writing an, uh, I'm writing a research paper, mm -hmm. and a literature review, and it's not been easy. Uh, going through a number of articles and even trying to come up with an introduction has been very, um, um, I don't even, tedious and hard. And I have all these thoughts. I have all these ideas. But what you said about um, our values in terms of how um, to, um, even though we have, let's say we have the rubrics, we know what the professor is asking us to do, but then it's like, that element, that part of us is not, uh, um, it's out of the equation. So how do I, how do I bring myself into like my, add my value to it and then still maintain or still be able to um, do what the professor is requiring of me? Yeah, and it is difficult when you're at that stage where you're trying to, um, when you're trying to balance those two things because you want and deserve to do well at the assignment. And that will be, you are, you, you know, no matter how perfectly you do it, if it doesn't match what the professor wants or what's on the rubric, you won't be able to get marks. So, you know, I do tell my students, like, there are, there are things that you won't be able to bring your whole self to. Um, if you find ways of always do pay attention to the, the questions that always do, if there is a rubric, please pay as much attention as you can to it. Don't feel like you have to overthink things. I think one of the things we do, especially with literature reviews, is we don't trust ourselves. Um, right. I often find that with students where they don't, they feel like, like I've read all these papers now and I have thoughts about them and you say you have about them. Um, that's good, that's fine. And if it seems like it's too obvious to you, remember that the person who's reading it won't have literally just sat down and read all those papers. The chances of that having happened are infinitesimally small. Even yeah. your professor or whatever won't have just sat down and read all of those papers. And your thoughts about it, you are part of the research here. This is research and you are the key part of it. Your brain is doing the job of synthesizing that information and figuring out things about it and how you react to it and how you describe it is important and valuable. And however you come across in that and whatever is important to you in that, you can like, you can trust yourself, you know? Um, and as long as you're staying within that, you, you might not be able to do it exactly the way you want because you have to stay within the rubric, but you know, you, you can trust yourself and you can show how you reacted to those papers for most things. I mean, like I can't promise anything because you could have a really re unreasonable professor. But. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make your professor be nice to you, but <laughs> if I can <laughs> Thank you so much. It's thank you so much. <laughs> You're really welcome. Yeah, you you want to be right. You're trying to overthink things um, in the comments. You're trying to overthink things. I know, I know. And it's it's really and the thing about academic work is that it will expand to fill whatever time you give it. There is a huge amount of human information out there. You could always read another paper. You could always do another level of analysis. Always add another element to your. You could always add another uh, method. You know whatever it is. So at a certain point, you have to balance and it is always better, like finished is better than perfect and perfect is never finished. So, you know, just get it off. Sometimes with these things, if there's a rubric and a professor involved at the other end of it, the best thing you can do is just get it off your desk and just see everything that you're doing as part of a degree program. The purpose of it isn't to show off. So for example, I'm, I'm supervising the educational research projects. They're like miniature research projects um, for masters and late undergrad students at the moment. And I keep telling them like, look at how many credits this is worth. And remember that the purpose of any submission in the program, and especially these kind of research ones, it's not to show, like my PhD was not the purpose, the primary purpose of it was not to disseminate a piece of research. The primary purpose of my PhD program is to share with an examiner the process that I went through and the skills that I've learned so that they can sign off on giving me a degree. 
And that's true for all of your assignments and all of your theses and stuff. The first purpose of it is for you to get what you need out of it, to develop and demonstrate the skills and competencies that you need to, to get the degree that you want. So don't, when you get into that thing of, I need to make this more perfect, I need to do more research, whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. Be gentle with yourself as much as you can, but also look how many credits is this worth and what is the purpose of it? And the purpose of it is to, is to get there. Um, okay, I will try to answer some of these questions. How do I find the balance when I'm asked to minimize? Um, I really want to be as clear as possible when I'm communicating. Um, sometimes we need to cut things down. You need to find like the key thing that you're trying to achieve with it um, and just focus on that. And, and do you know the do you know the phrase when you're writing of kill your darlings? Um, that's a that's a phrase that's used sometimes in like fiction of uh, and it means like like you will sometimes have to get rid of those that you want there. So when you're writing a story, you might have a character that you absolutely love writing this character and that character is like so fun to write. But if at a certain point you realize that that character does not lend themselves to the plot, they're kind of doing their own thing, they're taking like focus off from other characters that need to have the focus, sometimes you will need to remove that character even if you like that character. Um, and it doesn't mean like if you like something in your story, you should get rid of it. It means like if you're just including something because it's your pet thing or it's the thing that you really like, sometimes you have to... Do it. it is difficult. It's difficult to find the balance. Somebody has asked about public speaking, so I will do that in a second, and I will do volcanoes because I there's no stopping me talking about volcanoes. Okay, um, so that's my tar repository. Oh, this is uh my soundtrack for my thesis is BTS Life Goes On. Um, if you want a song recommendation, that was another thing that I was doing during the pandemic is like song recommendations. Um. Oh, that was the providing time. Okay, presentation tips. Somebody asked about presentations. Um, practice is the most important thing with presentations. The more you practice, the more comfortable you'll be, no matter how anxious you start off being. Breathing is also really important. I find it especially important because I have a tendency to like, this is me talking slowly. I am making an effort to talk slowly. I could be talking faster. <laughs> um, and breathing will help you with that. We tend to talk faster when we're nervous as well. Um, and also you really don't want to faint. So, you know, breathing crucial for that. When I'm making my slides uh, for a general audience, you want like a maximum of three things on it. A lot of the time my slides for general audience will have one thing on it, either one short quote, one word, literally or an image. Um, if you want to make, like my slides are fancy because I enjoy doing that. You don't have to do that. There are so many templates these days, but pick something that looks easy, uh, you know, keep it simple, use, um, be aware of accessibility. Those things may not help you with feeling better about it directly, but when I feel more prepared and I feel like I've put thought into what my slides are and what I'm going to do and la la la, then I feel more prepared. Uh, but practice is the really important part. If you are feeling nervous, practicing will really, really help. Do it by yourself then do it in front of a mirror, then do it in front of your favorite softest, nicest person, then do it in front of a slightly less nice person, like work, work your way up. <laughs> if you're feeling confident, you should still practice. My worst presentations were when I thought that it would be fine and I didn't practice. Um, if you tend to talk too fast or talk too slow or find difficult to find your train of thought, practice. And if you are given a time limit, please, for the love of fuck, stick to the time limit there's so much annoying and I know I haven't done that we're like we're like we're over time now um but if you are on a conference especially um don't don't use up other people's time um if you do have anxiety and stage fright ner feeling nervous is is useful it is a thing that your body is doing to try to help you um it, it understands your body understands on some weird deep level that you could get hurt and it's trying to protect you from feeling like you're going to get hurt but obviously if it's if you feel too nervous it's you know you're going to freeze up or you're going to feel sick or something that's not good um it is possible to physically stop the feedback loop 
So when you start thinking nervous thoughts, you start having physical response to the nervous thoughts. And when you have a physical response to the nervous thoughts, it makes you more nervous. You can physically break the loop. And the easiest way to do it is by breathing and doing any kind of grounding exercise. So my favorite grounding exercise is take a minute to focus on five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. If the thing you can taste is just your own tongue inside your mouth, that's fine. But, you know, I like, I'll lick something, but you don't have to lick something. <laughs> but it just, it puts you back in the present moment and it breaks the loop for a minute. And sometimes that's all you need. Um, so breathing, practicing, having a kind of a grounding thing, or if you have something that makes you feel better, don't let it, you know, like I will, I will have, um, you know, like my BTS bracelets on or something that will make me feel a little bit better. Don't feel like you're childish if you want to bring a cuddle boy with you. Um, whatever. Yeah. T t tell yourself good thoughts as well that you can break that. I find it much easier to break the feedback loop on the physical side. You can also break the feedback loop on the mental side, actually just talking to yourself in a nice way. Pretend that you are talking to uh, like an older child, like an eight-year-old. Talk to yourself like you would talk to an eight-year-old. Um, you wouldn't, I hope, tell the eight-year-old to just like cop on or stop being stupid. You would tell the eight-year-old like, it's going to be okay. It's, it makes sense to be anxious, but like you have prepared, you're okay to do this. Uh, is there anything I can do to help kind of stuff? Um, okay, volcanoes. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to, um, since we are a little bit over, those yes. of you who want to stick around, um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, and then those of you who have to take off, that's totally fine. Just remember you need to have the, um, written reflection for today submitted by midnight tonight, and then email me if you have any other questions. Okay, so my favorite thing to talk about with regard to volcanoes is that when I was in Hawaii, I went to see uh, Kilauea volcano, which is a huge volcano. Oh, you're very welcome. Goodbye to the people who have to go. Um, Kilauea volcano is a shield volcano that's um, active, and it has a, I will have a great weekend. I'm seeing uh, Suga from BTS in concert. I'm super excited. <laughs> At the top of Kilauea is a crater called Halemaumau Crater. Um, it's full of a lava lake. But for like 35 years or something, there was this um, side vent. It's uh, at called Pu'o. That's still there. And lava comes out of the side vent at Pu'o and goes down through these lava tubes and hit the sea at Kalapana. But it no longer happens. Um, it stopped a couple of years ago. But when I was there, it was still happening. So the lava would go down through the lava tubes and come out. Um, and I made this, this is a painting that I did of when I visited it. So you can see the red flash in the middle of the painting. That's the lava coming out and it would pour out from the lava tubes and go down into the sea. When the lava, when lava hits sea, the lava flash freezes and the sea flash boils. So you get this huge plume of like steam coming up from the sea. And if you go, like we were on a boat, we came close to it. If you pull up a bucket of water, even this far back from it, the water is like salty bath water. Like it's warm, warm because of the lava coming in. Um, so just to the left of the red flash, you can see like a, a, a little burst um, because sometimes when a, a hot piece of lava would hit the sea, it would like explode into like little shards of obsidian. And one of those shards just forward from just on the sea, you can see a black dot that's steaming. The obsidian is a rock. And like, if you throw obsidian into water, it will sink obviously, um, but it was so hot. They would float for a few minutes, just letting off steam um, along the side. And all of these cliffs are just made from the basaltic lava that came down through here. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. It was like the most amazing experiences of my life. And when we were going back and we went out on a boat, we saw it and it was amazing. And like, obviously like somebody brought us there who like does boats. Um, and as we were going back, um, part of the fifth base steered off and fell into the sea and our boat went like, Whoosh, on the wave that, that came out of it my partner was with me and was like clutching the rail of the boat I was like <laughs> telling himself like it's fine it's supposed to happen all the time it's completely fine boat people know what to do we're not gonna die we're not gonna die everything's fine everything's fine and we got back to the uh the little port um and got off the boat and the boat people were like 
was mental. That's never happened before. Oh God, we thought we were gonna die. <laughs> but they've been like super calm when we were actually out there so that we wouldn't freak out. <laughs> now my partner had to go and sit down for a long time. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was like, this is amazing. This is like a roller coaster. I'm having the best time of my life. Um, so yeah, volcanoes, love volcanoes. What's a volcano story for you? Top tips. Are there any more questions or do you want to leave? Thank you so much. You're so welcome. This isn't the first time I don't want to leave a class. I'm always, <laughs> the, I'm always the first one ready to sign out. And this is the first time. Like, Professor, I'm always the first one to say, all right, bye, Professor. Have a good yep. day. That's, I can I can one hundred percent attest to that. Yeah. I think we all we are all some way somehow when it comes to writing, it's like it's it doesn't come easily. Yeah, Even, no matter how prepared you are, you still somehow you know struggle. And I and I sometimes I have to I overthink because I I wasn't born here. I was born in Ghana, and now uh, I, our schools were all like from Britain. And sometimes when you say something someone here tries to correct you. I'm like, no, it's still, it's still. So I, I love the fact that you talked about languages and dialects and how all, they are all like, you know, connected. It's English, whether yeah. I'm from Ghana or not, it's still English. And it's so hard when someone is trying to like correct you when you know that your, your, your sentences and your grammars are right, but someone is still trying to correct you because that's, you know, they have yeah, to- it's, it's really frustrating. Yeah it's classist and it's racist and it happens all the time and the individual person may or may not be like trying to make you feel excluded but it does make us feel excluded like it's you know and especially like it, the the further away you get from standard English and the further away you get from the kind of person that people think you should be in academia the worse it is and the harder it is um and it does make us question ourselves as well like it's yeah and I, I go through that a lot it impacts um your writing and like you want to uh whatever even if you're structuring your sentences you are oh, okay am I structuring is it is it right is the professor going to question my but professor Leah is very good with that <laughs> <laughs> so far most of the professors are very you know they all like they like my writing style and that makes me happy like knowing that I'm, I'm it's like no one is you know like trying to say that I'm you know I'm grammatically wrong, wrong. yeah good yeah I'm thank you that. so much I I I wrote that I followed you on Twitter and uh, uh, good, good. <laughs> and LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm very bad at using Twitter but I'm I'm gonna try to get better <laughs> thank I you so much it. when I looked at your Twitter I was like what's 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 up with this <laughs> but now <laughs> but now I know <laughs> I'm glad I'll, Thank I'll you so much. Leave it <laughs> really Thank glad. You. Thank you so Enjoy much. Enjoy yourself.